day. Uh, so good morning, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking time to join us uh, for this webinar, uh, which is titled Why Wildlife Migratory Corridors Matter and Why as a People and Indeed the Media uh, We Should Care. Uh, recent reports, including The Living Planet uh, by WWF, uh, shows that wildlife population trends are in serious decline, uh, mostly due to human activity, land use change, and also climate change. Uh, no one says uh, better, uh, this better than the Pope Francis about our actions as human beings. And I quote him, Africa offers the world a beauty and natural richness which inspires praise of the creator. This patrimony of Africa and of all mankind is constantly exposed to the risk of destruction caused by human selfishness of every type and by the abuse of situations of poverty and exclusion. Uh, Pope Francis said these uh, on an address to the United Nations office in Nairobi uh, in November 2015 during his historical visit in Africa. So securing wildlife migratory corridors and dispersal areas is therefore seen as one of the ways of reversing these trends. We, be, we believe that storytelling and fact-based journalism can go a long way in reaching people with credible information that can inspire them to conserve their natural resources. To help us in this endeavor, we have speakers who have dedicated their lives to caring for wildlife and the environment, and they will help us to break down this issue uh, today. This webinar is a collaboration between Wildlife Direct and Internews Earth Journalism Network. Internews, uh, Internews supports media in 100 countries through giving them tools to survive and thrive. Earth Journalism Network is the environmental arm of Internews, which has a membership of over 13,000 reporters in over 100 countries. In East Africa, uh, Earth Journalism Network project seeks to improve the quality and quantity of media coverage of environment, wildlife, and conservation issues. To become a member of EJN, if you're not already, kindly visit our website, earthjournalism.net, and you'll be guided on a very simple, uh, a simple uh, process uh, of becoming a member. And then from there, we'll be receiving our resources like this webinar and a lot of other works we do, like uh, we issue story stipends uh, to, and trainings uh, to enable you to do those stories that you otherwise be not be able to do that will be recording this webinar uh, to help us share uh, with our network we will upload it on our website uh, we won't have uh, we would have powerpoint presentations but ho hopefully we'll have a ripe discussion with the speakers after which we'll answer your questions kindly use the q and a feature at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions again don't use the chat i uh, use uh, the q and a uh, feature uh, before introducing the speakers, can you allow me uh, to bring out uh, that description uh, about uh, Wildlife Direct, uh, which is a Kenyan-based organization that seeks to change hearts, minds, and laws so that Africa's wildlife endures forever. Its, its mission is to connect people to their wildlife and nature and inspiring them to treasure it and act to conserve it. Most importantly, and relating to this webinar today, Wildlife Direct works to secure critical wildlife buffer zones, dispersal, dispersal areas, and corridors. And we are glad that we are joined today uh, by Wildlife CEO, uh, Paul Dakahumbu, uh, who will take us through you know, uh, these buffer zones and tell us more you know, about wildlife uh, uh, corridors. And again, uh, as we wait for more to join, kindly use the Q&A feature uh, as we have a discussion with the panelists, uh, one, uh, one by one, we'll pose questions to them, uh, and then we we'll react to these. Uh, you can ask your question at any time, and then I'll be sure uh, to read uh, this to them. And uh, I think uh, we should, you know, uh, put this car on the road. Uh, and, and for the in interest of time, I'll call the speakers one by one and ask them to introduce self and give us a brief, op brief opening uh, remarks. I uh, will start with Paul Lakahumbu, who is the CEO of Wildlife Direct and who I describe as a passionate and cons consummate you know, conservationist. Paula, congratulations for winning two prestigious awards, a heartbeat from each other, uh, one being uh, the Rorex National Geographic Explorer of the Year for 2021, and also the Wheatley Gold Award 2021, which is considered the Green Oscars. Uh, kindly, with your opening remarks, you could tell us what this win means uh, for you and for Kenya and for Africa and for nature. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Kyundu. I just want to quickly check that you can hear me. 
Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Super. Um, uh, so first, I just want to say thank you so much for this partnership in, in doing this presentation, and I hope it will become one of several moving forward. It is so important for us as Kenyans to ensure that the media is well informed about matters that are so vital for the um, healthy economy, not just healthy environment. Uh, the Whitley Gold Award and the Rolex National Geographic Awards are both accolades that in a way illustrate that the whole world is watching what we are doing. This is really important because Kenya is seen as a country um, of great national uh, heritage and treasures that are of global importance. Um, it also means that the, the West and the North and even the East are now looking at Africa for leadership in many of these issues. Um, for the first time, we're seeing uh, more attention on diversifying the voices at a global level when it comes to matters to do with conservation, climate change, and biodiversity. So I'm just going to give you a quick uh, brief about uh, conservation and migrations. I think it's, um, I would have liked to have done a presentation, but because of the problem with the internet, I've not put it in the form of a presentation, but I will share my notes. So I want to put into context what migrations are. And, but I'm going to start first with Kenya, why migrations are so important to this country. We are what's considered a mega diverse country. That means we have more biodiversity than most other countries in the world. And this is related to the fact that we have a very diverse type topography from mountains with glaciers to deserts to coral reefs, the Great Rift Valley. All of these different topographies have created extraordinary landscapes and habitats that are supporting a massive diversity of species. This diversity is also a major part of our economy. 10% of our GDP comes from tourism and that industry supports over 300,000 people. So wildlife is very important to our country um, from an economic perspective. But our wildlife numbers are declining and they're declining at such a rapid rate um, that uh, despite everything we've been saying in international fora, in fact, Kenya has, is becoming an embarrassing example of failed conservation. And, the, and part of this failed conservation is actually giving us a very bad name in Africa. The South Africans in particular like to remind us that uh, our, our model is not working because we have seen declines of 60 to 90% of some of our species. However, our president Uhuru Kenyatta has been speaking um, and making great promises at, for example, at the Leaders Pledge for Nature at the United Nations General Assembly last September, where he said, as a country, we have been making mistakes. When we do developments that threaten nature and the environment, it is therefore not sustainable. And he made a commitment to stop that from happening. He made a commitment to end extinctions by 2030. So I think we have a lot of political support and, and that's why this is so important that we use the media to amplify the issues so that we remind our leaders, our decision makers on what their duties are. Just a couple of weeks ago, we saw, actually just a week ago, we saw 200 dick dicks killed in one day by poachers. The pictures were horrifying and disturbing, but those de declines and those losses are nothing compared to what is happening to our wildlife that migrates. Most of Kenya's wildlife is migratory, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what it means to be migrating wildlife. We all know about the wildebeest, but the wildebeest, which represents about 2 million animals coming in from Tanzania and going back to Tanzania is only a small part of the migrations. Actually, there are many other species that also migrate. Zebra, Kongoni, even our small antelopes like um, gazelles and impalas. Um, so what is a migration? A migration is a pattern of behavior where animals travel from one place, they move to another habitat, and then they come back again in a seasonal rotation. Why do they move? They move in search of food, sometimes better conditions, sometimes it's to do with their reproductive needs. It could be water. And um, human beings have been part of these migrations for millennia. We call this transhumance or pastoralism in which the people actually move in the same kind of cycle as the wildlife. And this has been happening for millennia. So this is very different from what we call emigration, when people move to another place and they don't come back, or when animals move to another place and don't come back. So many species migrate, as I said, that includes birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. They go by air, by sea, by land. We're talking primarily here about by land, but just to give you an example of how important migrations are, 255 species of bird migrate 
through Africa from Europe, they, they represent 2.1 billion birds. 2.1 billion, right? You can imagine how huge, th what this means in terms of ecology. It's an enormous number of animals that are moving. In bats, Zambia alone hosts 10 million bats that migrate through that country. Uh, animals move enormous distances. You know, some animals will literally move. There's one particular bird that moves um, over 76,000 kilometers. It's called the Arctic Turn. And it flies from the Arctic down to the Antarctic on an annual cycle. Um, so we know that the animals roam and they migrate in search of food and grass. And in order for these migrations to happen, those landscapes need to be import, need to be kept open. So why do these migrations matter? They matter because the abundance of diversity of animals in our ecosystems is supported by the movement of all these other animals and creatures. They are moving seeds, they're moving nutrients, and they are connecting different ecosystems. And this promotes the resilience in the ecosystems and it sustains so much biodiversity, it sustains communities, it sustains economies, and they become the primary prey base for most of the world's top carnivores. So this is why it is so important. I think I've reached my five minute limit. If there's any questions, please do drop them in, into the, to the quest Q and A and, and we will go into more detail on some of these issues. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Paula. Uh, that was a really uh, great uh, background uh, about why it is important to understand what the migratory corridors are, the migratory species, because as you say, we, most of us know about elephants, others wild beasts, and it's good to know even fish and birds migrate, and we really need to conserve these. Uh, and we'll hear this, you know, as we move uh, on uh, with this webinar. Uh, I see we have more participants joining us. Kindly, if you're just joining us, uh, we're taking uh, round one uh, as where I'm putting questions to our panelists, and, and then kindly put your question to them on Q and A so that I can put the questions to them as far uh, as now uh, from round one before we open up for Q and A to everyone. Again, don't use the chat. Uh, feature use the Q and A and kindly note that we're we're recording this webinar and we'll be able to share it uh, on our website uh, once uh, we are done uh, with the webinar. Now we'll you, go. Uh, oh, yes, please. I, I just wanted to. Can I add something small about elephants in particular since you brought it up? Okay. Okay. Please. I just want to say that elephants do migrate, but they they are not as predictable as wildebeest. In fact, um, elephants will stay in the same place if the conditions are right, or they will move if they need to go find in search of food or water or mates, for example. And, and these migrations are well known and well studied and the timing you know, is related to rainfall just like for our other species. Um, but I wouldn't call elephants as, as a, they're not described as migratory species the way that some of the other species are described as migratory species. And that makes it much more complicated for elephants because these animals are very intelligent and they have a very complex relationship with the environments in which they live. Thank you. Thank you uh, for bringing that up. Uh, I hope we've all you noticed because uh, I think that's almost a common uh, misconception uh, about uh, you know migration. And that's what comes to mind uh, to most people when you talk about uh, the migratory uh, species. I'll now go to our you know, second speaker, who is Dixon um, Kaelo, the founding CEO of the Kenya Wildlife Conservancy Association. Uh, Dixon, uh, kindly tell us you know, uh, about uh, the, community, the concept of community conservancies and why they are key uh, in conserving a wildlife environment and also these um, migratory uh, corridors. And as you briefly tell us about community, how the community is living in these conservancy have historically coexisted with wildlife, especially looking at the migratory corridors and the spatial areas. And of course the threats and conflicts, if any, uh, that this cause existent has uh, uh, posed uh, historically uh, before now we come to, uh, to the modern day. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Kiondo, and, and, and thank you, uh, Paula, for um, elaborating the importance of migrations uh, globally uh, and, and therefore the relevance uh, in our discussion today as we also focus into our country, Kenya. 
uh, before I share some thoughts around uh, the conservancies as a strategy uh, for maintaining open spaces and, and allowing migration of wildlife to persist, let me just uh, reiterate uh, the point that uh, um, uh, Dr. Kahumbu has just raised that migration is not a luxury, it's actually essential for the survival, long-term survival of wildlife. And, and often uh, we get confronted with um, questions around why do wildlife leave national parks? Uh, there are these areas designated for national, as national parks and reserves. Why can't wildlife be contended with those uh, spaces? Why do they come out and, and bother people? And I think we need uh, to clearly understand this, um, that, that indeed for survival, uh, wildlife do need to move. Um, and some movements are localized. They can be uh, short distances over a day, and they can also be very long distances over large areas of land. Some of them seasonal, some of them um, uh, even actually occurring on an annual basis. Um, I think the, the, there are several reasons why this is, uh, subject is particularly important uh, in our own country. Uh, seems like we're losing Dixon. Hello, Mr. Kylo. Seems like we've momentarily lost him. As we try to raise him again, uh, Dr. Paula, I'll come back to you. Uh, there's a few questions here to Dr. Kahumbu. Which bird species in Kenya are most threatened and what conservation measures are being done? Uh, this is from Charles Jeru, a freelance journalist based here in Kenya. Oh, thank you, Charles, for that question. I can see that Dixon is back. I don't know if I'm you want back. to sorry. answer the question. Oh, OK, sorry. OK, sorry. OK, I will come back to that question later. Let's continue with you, Dixon. Thank you. Uh, sorry, unfortunately, I got disconnected a little bit, but I'm back. Yeah, so I was basically saying that other than several national parks, uh, national park, both the east and west are 22,000 uh, kilometers squared. And perhaps the Maasai Mara at 1,500 plus, almost 30,000 kilometers of Serengeti, majority of our other nearly 60 per 60 national parks and reserve are not oversized to provide the all needs of, uh, of, of wildlife. Uh, and, and, and partly it's because one of all majority of our wildlife are large bodied. Uh, they generally are living in an environment where water and pasture uh, is scarce. They move to avoid the spread of diseases they move in order to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to avoid inbreeding. Uh, and also they move uh, because uh, over, over, over uh, uh, a long time, they've always done that. And so this is a condition that's already uh, set up in, in their mind that wildlife have to move. Uh, and if they don't move, uh, first of all, we'll have to spend a lot of money as a country to manage closed ecosystem. We've seen the case of Nakuru, for example, National Park, which now requires human intervention in terms of regulating breeding, movement, feeding of wildlife. And so if movement was not allowed, we are likely to lose um, a lot of our wildlife. But it's also because the, the, the inability of wildlife to move is the driver of why we have um, growing human wildlife uh, conflict. And so this wildlife that generally uh, are contained and occupy parks move out of these areas into what we are calling corridors. And I think for us, the, the starting point is to recognize that dispersal areas are by definition also land by, owned by people. And I think the moment we begin realizing that there is nothing called a migratory corridor uh, um, as such, th this is land owned by an individual or a community. And so unless we intervene at that level, corridors are going to continue closing. And so at uh, KWCA, uh, we, we work together with the landowners and the local communities that live in areas that are previously described as dispersal areas and corridors, and, and generally creating conservation model that integrate um, la other land uses, but include uh, biodiversity conservation. Our network now spans across uh, nearly 160 uh, conservancies, and it's really growing fast. Uh, particularly driven by re the recognition in 2017 uh, through the Kenya Vision 2030 that securing corridors 
uh, and, and, and wildlife migratory areas is going to be a very, very important priority uh, in our country. And so these areas are generally around national parks. Communities generally make decisions to include wildlife conservation in their use of the land. Land use plans are drawn, management plans are developed, grazing plans are put in place, which then allow uh, uh, wildlife to be uh, to be uh, able to move um, over, over larger areas. And we've seen that nearly 22% of our wildlife today uh, is found within these conservancies. And, and this compares favorably to about 38% of wildlife in national parks. And, and of course, there is still more wildlife out there that is neither in parks or reserves uh, or conservancies that we need to. And so our work is to try and expand the area where uh, landowners either privately or individually uh, managing their land in a way that include wildlife so that we are able to allow move, uh, movement of wildlife to, uh, to persist um, and, and to continue. Uh, and, and therefore the importance of creating incentives and, and putting in place, uh, um, uh, you know, um, conservation models that would allow the local communities to participate uh, in wildlife conservation and not just focusing on parks and reserves, but going out, so, out of those areas to encompass much larger areas. And so by doing that, we create uh, an ability for wildlife to be able to move, therefore reducing human wildlife conflict uh, and, and also uh, biodiversity loss. Thank you. Kundu, you are muted. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kailo, uh, for your incisive uh, take uh, on importance uh, of conservancies and the people living there in uh, to conserve uh, these conservancies. And I'm glad to see that Samuel Kanki, you know, has just joined us. Uh, Samuel, uh, if you can hear me, Bona Samuel. Hello, um, Samuel Kanki, Kanki is our other speaker uh, who has just joined. I would like to test his sound before we move on. Uh, can you hear me, uh, sir? Uh, Paula, as we try to do that, if we could take the question again uh, that we had from Charles Jeru uh, as we move on. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Charles. Um, as I said, there are over 255,000, oh, sorry, 255 species of birds that fly through Africa. 40% of those species are at risk. And um, I'll just name a few of them and I'll tell you what the real threats are facing them. For example, vultures. Kenya's vultures move from places like uh, Hell's Gate National Park, they will move all the way down to the southern part of Serengeti, they will move all the way to Sudan, they are basically following the Great Rift Valley. When we have issues of human wildlife conflict in places like Masai Mara, or some of the ranches in the Rift Valley, vultures will end up feeding on carcasses of livestock that have been treated with pesticides by the communities to kill those pests, but vultures will die in huge numbers. Kenya's vultures have declined by between 50 and 80% because of the use of pesticides like furidam to kill lions and other animals. The other major threat to animals like vultures, <clears throat> birds of prey that come down the flyways during the winter migration is windmills. As you know, the Kenyan government is investing heavily in windmills and, and this green energy along the Rift Valley where you have these wonderful air flows, but birds, <clears throat> birds find it very difficult to navigate these landscapes because if you can imagine the speed at which those wing tips of those massive windmills are circulating, it creates a kind of a vacuum and it sucks birds into those windmills. And we're seeing a lot of deaths of windmills uh, on windmills. And uh, there has been a lot of work done by Nature Kenya, by Paul Matiku and his team to try and address this problem by through the EIA process and looking for alternatives. Other birds like cranes, storks, water birds, flamingos that depend on wetlands are at great risk because of the draining of our swamps, pollution in our swamps, and also the killing of animals directly for food in those landscapes. So those are some of the major threats that I would say we're seeing, you know, loss of habitat, infrastructure, power lines, windmills, and then the pesticide poisoning of um, human, you know, people in retaliation to human wildlife conflict. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure Jeru will be satisfied with that answer. And again, to the journalists, uh, when you're asking your question, kindly put it on Q&A and be sure to remind us where you are from, uh, the your media house and which city and country uh, you are in. Uh, speaking of countries, uh, Paula, we have a question from Nigeria. Have you seen it? Are you able to take that? The one from Richard Ali? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Right. So he's talking about the problem of, of internal insecurity challenges like Boko Haram. Um, I would say, yes, absolutely. East Africa has seen these kinds of challenges. Uh, for example, we know that in the 70s and the 80s, especially, uh, we had enormous amount of um, conflict leading to the death of elephants and also hippos. So a country like Congo has lost 90% of its hippopotamus because of the conflict in the East. Um, it's very, this is a very difficult issue. If you go into Northern Kenya towards the coast where we have the issue of Al-Shabaab in the uh, forests up there, the Boni Dodori forests, we know that there are challenges there. It's very difficult for conservationists to work in landscapes where there are these kinds of uh, insecurity and conflicts. But what we have seen, and I think Dixon is the best person to talk about this, is how successful conservancies and community conservation efforts have been in those landscapes to provide an alternative. You know, why do we have insecurity? It's often driven by poverty and lack of opportunities for the local communities. Insecurity makes it very difficult for people to continue with their normal livelihoods. And conservancies are providing a source of security that enables them to continue and do business and thrive. So I don't know if, if, uh, if Dixon would like to add anything to that, but uh, this is a big concern across many parts of Africa. And we've seen how it's affected countries like Mozambique, Angola, uh, Central African Republic, the Congo, uh, and of course, here in, in Kenya, in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and, and even uh, further up in Somalia. Perhaps just to, um, uh, if Kyondo, uh, you allow me to add um, a word to um, answer the, um, Richard Ali, uh, is, is to say that uh, the, the Kenya has adopted, uh, in addition to uh, government engaged uh, security forces um, and, and rangers uh, under the leadership of the Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, the country has adopted the work of uh, conservancy rangers, sometimes called uh, community rangers. And we now have um, about 4,200 uh, spread across um, the different landscape. What this does is that it provides additional eyes, ears, and legs uh, uh, to increase coverage and surveillance ability for those that um, are able to, uh, are working to conserve wildlife. And, and we've seen in places, for example, in the Amboseli region, uh, where we have uh, nearly 300 and uh, nearly 400 now rangers, that um, the, the, the landscape has recorded zero poaching over the last five years, uh, been mainly through um, a, a, a partnership between community, uh, <clears throat> community policing and also government um, uh, law enforcement efforts. And, and in Northern Kenya, for example, where we have more than 750 rangers, um, the cases of um, cattle rustling, uh, theft, um, or, and, and, and harassment of people who are traveling uh, and Ill other illegal activities, including the spread of firearms, illegal firearms, has, uh, has largely been uh, scaled down significantly uh, in some of the northern country, uh, counties of, of our country where, um, where there, there, there were um, you know, major challenges. So uh, indeed, uh, just to report that it's actually possible to use conservation as a means of improving security uh, and enhancing community cohesion and addressing resource use uh, uh, conflicts, uh, in our case, using the, the Rangers network. Thank you so much, uh, both for your answers. Uh, it's enriching our webinar. And I really would like to bring in Samuel uh, to talk about you know, a case study uh, of a lad owner uh, and a representative for that matter uh, from Amboseli, uh, which I think will also you know, give us a way to answer Sarah Joe's question later. Uh, so Samuel, can you hear me please? Uh, I think we're having a challenge because I can't even reach uh, Samuel on phone. And uh, Samuel, uh, one more last time. Can you hear me? We'd like to hear from you kindly. Atrish, if you're able to reach him kindly, um, would love to hear from him. So because you're gonna 
and reach this uh, webinar. Uh, all right. Uh, hello? Hello, Samuel? You are you muted. Uh, Tob, if you could try to help me unmute uh, Mr. Samuel. All right, I just did, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Bona Samuel, can you hear me now? All righty. Um, so, uh, Bona Dixon Kailo, uh, before I move up uh, to, uh, to Elizabeth Gitari to talk about, you know, the legal aspect of these migratory corridors, uh, are you able to take um, Sarah Jean's question on Savo West? And uh, again, uh, speakers, uh, if you look at the question uh, Q and A, you are able to type your answer and answer live. Uh, so probably that can help. If you are able to type in uh, your answers, probably we'll skip that and go to another question because I know our uh, our participants are able to see that. Uh, so Sarah Jones is asking, can you tell me what has been done in Savo West? Uh, for example, to stop the overrun of Keto uh, through the park. Uh, but I, as I said, I thought this would, be, would come nicely after we have heard from uh, a representative of blood owner, Jilambo Selly. Uh, are you able to take it at this juncture? Uh, Paula Kahumbu or Dixon Kailo? Um, the question is about the, the uh, livestock in Savo West. Yes, um, I want to believe so. Uh, yes. Let me take and the this question. Is a, this is a very, very serious issue that uh, I would hesitate to respond to because this is a government issue. Uh, the, the Savo East and Savo West, as well as other national parks, have been overrun with livestock, not only during the critical dry seasons, but increasingly um, at any other time of the year. And this has a huge impact on wildlife and even on wildlife movements because many animals will try to avoid livestock because they come with people. Uh, it's a big challenge. It's a major cause of loss of biodiversity. And um, I know that the Kenya Wildlife Service is working hard to try and address this problem, but there are political community um, and other dimensions that um, I wouldn't be able to speak about. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, uh, probably you've given <clears throat> us a, a story idea uh, uh, because one of the things we do, why we do these webinars is to give journalists a story idea and not basically about what we are talking about, uh, but from emerging issues like that one. So probably that's something. Well, that I think, I think uh, Kiyundu, the, the, the big thing with the problem of livestock in the parks is not just that they are um, consuming the vegetation, but if you recall last year, we had major fires in the Chulu Hills and also in the Savo West National Park. And people kept asking, what is happening? Why are we having these fires? It was extremely dry. There were a lot of livestock. But those fires were not natural fires. They were being lit by people in retaliation to being pushed out of the park. And those fires probably caused even more damage. You know, it's gonna take decades for the for these look these very fragile ecosystems to recover. So so it's more than just the animals are eating the vegetation. Actually, there there is much worse impact when we have these fires which are so devastating. I think it's a very good story for journalists to look at because. At the time we were fighting the Sabah West fire, there was about 200 other fires raging in the country. They were not getting much attention. Thank you so much uh, for bringing that up. Uh, and I hope that we've noted, uh, we have about uh, a good number of journalists, uh, about 40 uh, joined in. And I know somebody will be able to pick up this story and get in touch with us uh, for that expert view. Uh, so now, uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to get, um, uh, to get, um, Samuel, and now I'll move to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gitari, who is advocate for the Conservation Alliance of Kenya. Uh, uh, she's a Kenyan environmental natural resource conservation lawyer with over seven years experience and an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She has diverse expertise in wildlife, law enforcement, community large uh, channel system, conservancy models, environmental legislative systems, as well as environmental policy and energy law. And she starts at a prime uh, space uh, to tell us uh, what it uh, the legal you know technicalities when it comes to protecting wildlife and definitely you know the uh, ecosystems. Uh, so, uh, Elizabeth, uh, do you think that the current law 
that we have adequately protect the wildlife corridors? I, I uh, thank, thank you, Kiyonde, for, for that question. It's, uh, you know, we could answer no and keep quiet, but I think it's a lot more complicated than, than, than a no in the sense of there is some modicum of protection for corridors and migratory corridors, um, for, for migratory corridors for wildlife in the country. And you'll find it dispersed within the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, what people know as MK99. Um, you'll find it in the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act as well, but not as robustly as would be needed. And I think to answer that question, it would be best to go back to something that Dixon um, you know, alluded to earlier in the conversation. He said, uh, there is no such thing as a migratory corridor. These are people's land, this is private property. And I think if we look at it from an evolutionary perspective, we, we found these animals on us, right? They did not find us. I think uh, the ecologist, Dr. Kahumbu, might be able to correct me and tell me whether there are new microorganisms that are <laughs> created. Do they create themselves or that they are created? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what exactly the, the, the sequence is. But if we take the sun that we found these animals here, and that these animals like we've heard from Dr. Kahumbu as well as um, Dixon, that um, you know, they already have migratory patterns and how they move. Now, the problem then comes in that with the figures that Dixon gave us that 70% uh, of wildlife is on land that is not a national park, excuse me, or a national reserve, then you find yourself in a situation where you have wildlife on a person's private property, private property that is actually protected by the constitution under article 40, that every person has the right to own property anywhere in the country and to use it for whatever purpose that they need. But then you still have limitations to that particular right. Immediately you go to article 42, 69 and 70 in the constitution where you know the constitution then gives and provides um, for environmental rights, uh, you know, for the citizens of this country. And those environmental rights, there's a very interesting article um, in the constitution, article 24, that talks about that a person's exercise of their individual rights should not infringe on the exercise of another person's or, or should not infringe on another person's exercise of their other rights. So your right to property or my right to property should not infringe on the rights of a community uh, to have a clean and healthy environment, right? Um, the, uh, the rights of Kenya Wildlife Service, for instance, to manage uh, wildlife across this country should not infringe on the property rights of, 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 of communities. Now, the question then comes in, how exactly do we balance this tug of war between uh, conserving and protecting the environment which is referred to in our constitution as our national heritage for all the citizens of this country. How do we protect that right that's, um, and, and uh, the environment, uh, the environmental rights as um, outlined in part four of the constitution vis-a-vis -vis, you know, the, prop, uh, the property rights of the communities that I'm sure Mr. Kaanki would have talked about and also um, Mr. Mr. Kaelo is talking about as, as the CEO of, of Kenya Wildlife Conservancies. So there is no, to answer maybe your question in a very direct manner, there is no specific place in law where you will find, uh, you know, the law saying that these are the corridors in Kenya and these are the specific protections uh, provided for them. And this is what you can do in a wildlife corridor. And this is what you cannot do in a wildlife corridor. What we do is that we interpret what the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act talks about when it talks about ecosystem-wide uh, management plans that should be put in place by um, the Kenya Wildlife Service. Uh, we interpret what the what what EMCA talks about when it talks about proper management of the environment and so on and so forth. So there is definitely such a gap, and we've had such an extensive. Um, conversation uh, with uh, the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife in the current um, 
process that's undergoing for the review of the wildlife and management act because that's one of the key gaps that needs to be to be addressed and, and sorted out but i think even as we address it um, i'm a firm believer that um, law and policy should not sh should not champion conservation at the expense of community livelihoods or at the expense of livelihoods for people who actually own um, uh, that particular property. What we do need to find is a balance. Um, I think maybe the other challenge that I can um, allude to in respect of law is that when what the management and the conservation of wildlife migratory corridors is two pronged. Number one, the management of the wildlife itself that is passing through there. And number two, the management of the land on which the, mig the, the wildlife is migrating on, all right? But then when you go to the constitution, you find that land use planning and zoning is a function of county government, all right? Um, and then you then go on to uh, other parts of the constitution, not uh, part, um, schedule four, part one of the constitution that places the, the burden of the mandate for environmental governance and wildlife governance and management on national governments. So you do find that uh, even with these two parallel sort of systems that are needed in place, you cannot manage wildlife migratory corridors without managing the land use and the land use planning. And the person who's responsible for the formulation of those land use plans is the county government. You cannot manage wildlife migratory corridors without actually managing the wildlife, without knowing how to deal with the with the um, with the problem animal with human wildlife con conflict that is a function of Kenya Wildlife Service as per the constitution so what is actually needed is a mechanism that links these two processes to ensure that the, at the end of the day uh, you know biodiversity wins as well as uh, communities that actually provide this public good because it's a provision of a public good uh, providing and giving up their land for wildlife um, habitats. Thank you so much uh, for your take. Uh, it's indeed, as you said, you know, a complex, you know, area when it comes to that. And I don't know uh, if Dixon Kailo uh, will have any reaction uh, into this, into what uh, Elizabeth had just told us, you know, about, you know, finding a balance uh, between uh, you know, communities, uh, livelihoods, and also taking care of uh, the wildlife, uh, and of course, uh, the <coughs> migratory corridors. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I would like just to add on that voice, uh, um, and not more the legal aspect, but more the, the, the actual reality that conservation has always been pursued with the assumption that wildlife need to be on, on their own and that uh, protected areas are supposed to be pl people without places without people. On the other hand, human development has always been pursued to be um, providing services and, and, and building an environment for people without wildlife. The true reality of Africa and, and most of uh, the places of the earth is that wildlife and humans have, 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 have mixed and, 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 and stayed together for many, many, many years. And so really the creation of national parks and, and do human dominated landscape was not really the, the way Africa was wired to work. Even if you look at it uh, ecologically, trees and species of animals and plants do uh, are affected by human interference in one way or the other. And, and, and therefore, the failure of uh, past models of conservation was uh, to try and, and, and create a dichotomy between um, conservation and human development. And I think what um, um, uh, Elizabeth has described is the need to begin addressing both in one space using a particular model. And we think that the conservancy is, is one of the models. It's not the only model. There are other models that are being employed. But what a conservancy will try to do is to recognize the fact that humans own the land and they also have development interests and they have needs that needs to be met on the land. And wildlife, on the other hand, do need to move out and, and use some of these uh, open spaces. And so the question begins to be, how then do you um, intervene um, and, and try to recreate 
uh, the original Africa where people live amongst wildlife and therefore pro promoting what we now call uh, uh, um, coexistence. And so this is really uh, the, 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 the main pillar of a conservancy is, is to allow somebody to own the land uh, without necessarily evicting them because conservation has always been blamed for coming in and evicting uh, you know, people out of, uh, out of the area in the name of protecting species. And that creates anonymity because then those who are evicted are unhappy about the fact that they are not able to access uh, the resources. And therefore they begin uh, either actively or passively looking at wildlife as a, as a threat. And, and therefore then uh, you end up in a lose-lose situation. Um, and, and so to, to do this, uh, the conservancy basically creates an institution. Um, with a leadership structure. And this uh, leadership structure then is used uh, as a negotiation platform to say, wildlife do need to move. Um, you know, people have needs. How can we meet both of these needs um, uh, through um, planning for the land to create open spaces? So traditionally, majority of the conservancies will have areas for human settlements and they will try to improve access to water, access to health, access to education. Uh, on the other hand, doing land use planning uh, and also engaging with the county government to recognize the, 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 the land use plans that conservancies are made through the, the county spatial plans and create open spaces so that both livestock and wildlife uh, can, can coexist. And I think that there are um, illustrated successful um, cases and, 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 and Pala Research Center, for example, has documented the beneficial effect of a, live, a mixed livestock wildlife uh, uh, landscape. And, and actually related to the question around livestock in protected areas, um, really the problem, and, 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 and there is a lot of uh, science behind it, the problem of livestock is really not about the numbers of livestock. Uh, it is where they are in the landscape. Land do need to recover. And so if you manage whatever number of livestock you have in a way that allows some areas within the conservancy to rest and therefore allow grass to grow, you can actually create, create better condition with the, with the same livestock. And so the conservancies embrace livestock and actually some of the best breeders of, of livestock and some of the meat suppliers of livestock in this country are coming from uh, the conservancies. And all they do is they know that it's really not a question of numbers. It's a question of how can you manage grazing in a way that does not create conditions where livestock are in the same spot year in, year out, because that's what drives uh, land degradation. But if you manage through a zoning arrangement, and there are several models being employed by conservancies, uh, you know, where some of them creating zones and blocks and grazing livestock in a rotated manner to allow the land to recover, you actually can keep the grass tall and, and healthy and therefore keep the population of, of, of wildlife. Uh, of course, in a national park, that is not the reality because uh, the law requires that uh, generally, uh, unless there, 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 there is a plan, uh, livestock should not be in a, in, in a national park, but we, we focus on, on, on work on, 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 on the conservancies. Wow, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, and I was going to ask you about uh, uh, the examples that you uh, you have mentioned, and you mentioned that research. Uh, one of the things we like to do is, you know, share the resources uh, with the journalists that tune in, uh, and it'd be good to to see the models that you say the examples that have worked uh, on these you know coexistent uh, of people, livestock, and wildlife. Uh, that, that really uh, would uh, be helpful uh, to see how that has been able to work. And, uh, and I know there are many more challenges uh, coming to you, Dr. Paula uh, Kahumbu. You know, apart from livestock uh, in conservancies or in protected areas, and, and that uh, has also got to, to, to do with uh, uh, develop, development and also infra infrastructural development and also in agriculture, like we've seen in areas of, uh, you know, uh, Kimana. Uh, right. And apart, yes, apart from this challenge, like what you just highlighted about, you know, uh, the fires, uh, I came upon a research uh, that says that uh, infrastructural development in wildlife rich areas, uh, for instance, like the Stata Goji Lerui line, and you can give us many other ex modern examples uh, of Kenya and East Africa, uh, we, we, we wanted to have an East African community representative, but unfortunately they were not able to join us uh, to give us that aspect uh, of these challenges, uh, mostly infrastructural, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that are standing uh, 
you know, probably in the line of, uh, uh, of conservation. Uh, so the research uh, that I was alluding to, infrastructure development in wildlife rich areas like SGR has diverse ecological effects, including soil erosion and flooding. Uh, do we have real live uh, evidence uh, of this? <clears throat> well, before we get to the specifics, <clears throat> I, do, I just want to say that, you know, migrations are extremely important, but they are really threatened ecological processes. A migration is not just a bunch of animals moving around. It's an entire ecological process, right? These animals are moving, they're moving nutrients, they're moving seeds, they're changing habitats, they're basically engineering landscapes and creating the biodiversity that we're so proud of. And um, the interlinkages between these uh, different protected areas or biodiverse areas is really important because it promotes resilience and resilience in the face of so many other threats, uh, which could be climate change, for example. So I'll just go on to tell you a little bit about, you know, the kind of threats that affect migrations. We have issues like, um, sorry, somebody just tried to call me. Um, so we have issues like uh, um, infrastructure. We're talking of linear infrastructure, roads, railways, power lines, pipelines, those kinds of developments. Those are the things that we all know about. We've seen how fencing, especially as a result of the land adjudication process in Kenya, many of the new owners of title deeds are fencing their properties all around Amboseli, all around Masai Mara, and this is disastrous. Uh, we've already heard about Nak Nakuru National Park and the impact of fencing that protected area. As a result of all these developments, what we're seeing is a fragmented landscape that animals cannot navigate. And then the land is further degraded by the actual structures themselves. Like you said, it affects the soil, it affects water and water flow, the hydrological cycle. And some of these structures themselves are detrimental. For example, we saw recently how flamingos were flying into the power lines in Soisambu. We saw giraffes walking into power lines and being killed. These are all migratory animals. Um, um, so many of these animals are, are being threatened by these developments. But you know, we often tend to think of animals which are walking across land, think about animals which are in the air. They are affected by lights because they use light in order to navigate and their movements are disrupted by, by too much light. We see animals um, moving towards rubbish dumps. We've seen this in Nairobi. We see marabou stalks feeding in rubbish dumps. That is altering the movement of animals. That's another threat in many areas. And then we have the threats to our animals that live in and along waterways dams in particular, which we are erecting all across this continent at incredibly high speed with the aim of improving access to water, power generation or irrigation, those dams are actually interfering with the migration of fish, which is an, a group of species that hardly anybody thinks about. But actually we're losing our diversity of fish in the continent, which is actually an important part of our livelihoods. Um, all of this uh, not only is affected by climate change, but climate change itself further aggravates the problem. So think about it, when you have uh, animals that need to move up and down mountains during different seasons and you put barriers in their way, how on earth are they going to move as the climate changes and becomes warmer? Animals need to be able to move further up those mountains or further south because of the changes in, in um, climate as a result of this global, the global problem. Um, in our country, we have seen really devastating impacts. There is a, a very famous migration, the Serengeti Mara migration. Very few people know it actually comprises two migrations. There is the Mara Serengeti migration, which is the most well-known one. But there's also the Mara Loita migration, which is a different migration that goes east. That migration is 95% gone because purely just of fences that have been put up in that landscape. If you look at the migration of wildebeest, the second largest wildebeest in East Africa was the wildebeest migration from Nairobi National Park. It went east towards Afikapiti Plains and south to Amboseli National Park. These are different wildebeest to the ones we have in Masai Mara. Very few people know the Eastern white bearded wildebeest is actually endangered as a result of major highways, the EPZ zone around Athi River. And the government has been talking about securing the land, creating corridors, but at the same time, they're talking about fencing the national parks. You know, on the one hand, we're talking of building flyovers and uh, ways for animals to cross. And on the other hand, we're building bigger roads and we're building barriers in the middle of the roads. So animals are struggling to cross. 
That wildebeest migration from Nairobi National Park to Athi Kapiti has declined by 98%. There are literally about 400 wildebeest left in the Nairobi National Park eco area. And on the other side, there may be 2000. So these are some of the, the really serious threats that we see. What, what we fail to see when we look at the big, big animals is what's happening to the smaller animals. Go to Masai Mara. Every year, like clockwork, the wildebeest arrive and then the wildebeest go. But why do the wildebeest come? They come for water. They come for the Mara River, the only permanent source of water in the entire ecosystem. That water has been reduced by 60% because of upstream abstraction. And there's also pollution in that water. So now the wildebeest are less likely to be coming all this way if there isn't going to be enough water. Kenya is planning two new dams on that river. This is an issue that needs to be addressed now. We cannot afford to lose the wildebeest migration. Kenya was up in arms about Tanzania building a highway across the Serengeti, which we said would interrupt the movement of the wildebeest, which is true. But meanwhile, we are not addressing the real reason why the wildebeest are coming to Kenya, which is actually the water in the Mara River. So we really need to, to create that awareness because uh, the story that we have been hearing, which you see on National Geographic, it's a very simple story. It's been simplified for people all around the world. Actually, as Africans, we need to take responsibility, find out the science. There are lots of scientists. I know that people have been asking, where can we get more information? There are actually many scientific organizations that are working on this from the government institutions, the National Museums of Kenya, the Kenya Wildlife Service, there are scientific organizations like Save the Elephants, the Northern Rangelands Trust, the African Conservation Center, the ILRI, the International Livestock Research Institute. They have all been doing research on this. And some of those scientific papers might look complicated, but actually, if you know that the Mara River is vital, it's a vital lifeline for the Maasai Mara, then we absolutely must address the problem of all the abstraction for agriculture and the proposed new dams on the tributaries of that river, which will basically wipe out the migration. Why do I say this is such a big risk? Because often we don't know there's a problem until it's happened. We didn't know the wildebeest migration in Nairobi National Park to Arthur Kapiti was a problem until it had already declined by 80% is when people started talking about it. Because when you look at the numbers on the ground, they look like many, but it's only the scientists who are counting them and they can tell you, no, they're not many. They've actually already declined. The wildebeest migration of Masai Mara has already declined, but it's not only wildebeest. The last time I was there, I was talking to the guides and they told me that there are at least 12 species of large mammals that have already disappeared from the Masai Mara because of all of the degradation of the landscapes around there. They include animals with names like common bushbuck, common daika. These are animals which are supposed to be common, but they're already disappearing. These are the canaries in the mine. And as uh, journalists and as scientists, we need to work together to, to alert and to shine a light and raise the flag, there is a problem and we need to address it now. Thank wow, you. indeed. Uh, you know, thank you so much for bringing that uh, new aspect. Uh, and uh, probably there's a joke uh, that was shared by President Samia Suluhu the other day in Kenyan parliament and said that uh, the wild beast from Tanzania come to get pregnant in Kenya and go back to give birth. Uh, so they come more for than the water that you have told us in that, you know, really interesting to have this debate actually, even in parliament. And uh, it got me thinking, you know, how, you know, important it is. Uh, it goes uh, more than ecological, but even cultural bonds uh, between uh, even our East African uh, countries. Um, Doc, uh, Mr. Kylo, I would like to come back to you uh, with a question uh, that is on the Q&A and which was related to one of my uh, around two questions, and I think I will take these uh, from uh, uh, these from. Oops, uh, the questions are coming thick and fast, uh, so I'm losing some. Uh, it's from uh, Harriet Tawala, a journalist with People Daily. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Kylo. When you talk of development in conservancies going hard and hard with wildlife, what kind of development can go hard and hard with conservancies? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, in, indeed, uh, that, that's a, a very relevant question. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 de and generally, uh, to say that there are developments that are incompatible with wildlife, and, and maybe perhaps to also answer the question that was raised by Stephen Tyre of, of CDIFM um, around elephant uh, destruction of crops. 
Um, if you live in an area with a thousand, two thousand elephants, uh, and, and you come in and, and try to do your tomato farm, your maize farm, your whatever farm, uh, you are opening yourself to a problem and you're opening a problem uh, to elephants. So there are developments that are compatible to wildlife and there are developments that are not compatible with, uh, with wildlife. And, and, and the question is, um, how do you first of all uh, choose between those? And then how do you balance um, uh, the, the particular developments? Uh, turning um, a conservation area into a real estate, for example, or land speculators coming in and buying land with the intention to sell later with a, pro a profit and, and therefore fencing, you know, the particular small pieces of land in an area that is used by wildlife is um, a development that could be good elsewhere, but is not necessarily uh, the kind of development you want um, in, uh, in a conservation area. Um, livestock seems to be a development that is um, uh, that, that is uh, synergistic in a way, as, as long as you manage it. Uh, if you just allow wild livestock to also roam around the, the place without some level of uh, organized um, uh, grazing plan, then you can actually affect wildlife. And, and we know that there are species that do a little bit well when, when, there, is, when there is livestock and there are species like rhino, for example, that are very sensitive to any noises. And, and so the, the question is, to begin looking at what the communities are interested in. Of course, people want to live, uh, people want to do maybe some kitchen garden, people want to build a school uh, and, and to organize that around a settlement area and green what I would call green villages. Uh, these are villages where you're providing um, uh, support services to people because you also don't want to be seen to be uh, making the life of those that live in these areas more and more difficult by discouraging any kind of development. And, and the important thing to do is to do land zoning uh, so that you're able to um, uh, map out areas and, and say, you know, this particular spot uh, is an area that will be suitable for our human settlement. The, our small town will go in here uh, and, and then you keep the larger uh, landscape open. And this is not just good for wildlife. It's also good for uh, the pastoral people because livestock also do migrate and, and when drought come, they have to move. And if livestock are not able to move, then you are also going to impede their movement. And, and, and when drought comes, you have catastrophic, catastrophic uh, losses. And therefore means that you'll have to maybe provide um, a feeding program uh, during the drought season. And, and that's a cost to the taxpayer and, and, and a cost to the government. And so by creating an, an, an ability of wildlife to move, you also create an ability of livestock to move. Then, and, and if you look at it across the board in 80% of our country, which is rangelands, majority of the livelihood of the people there at above 60 to 90 percent are dependent on livestock. And so if you have a conservation intervention that also addresses the needs of livestock, then you're actually creating a win-win a win, a win uh, situation for, um, for, for the local community. And in relation to that, um, maybe just to answer the question from the chairman of, of, of the we, the ranch, we who asked whether there are um, uh, corridors that have been mapped out and, and indeed uh, also a question that was uh, shared earlier about the, the corridor and dispersal report that was prepared in 2017. Uh, and indeed that report, uh, and, and it, was, it has just been shared uh, by Paula, is, is an important report because uh, government spent a lot of resources to map out, carefully mapping out uh, these particular areas, including in the Savo region. And so the places where wildlife um, uh, move uh, are known and, and, and the local communities generally uh, do know that. And, and one of the steps to implement that um, uh, report was an attempt into, uh, a successful attempt actually in 2019 to create uh, a national wildlife strategy, the first ever national wildlife strategy uh, to be created in this country. And that report, that strategy has outlined uh, various measures that needs to be done in national parks, in national reserves, and in uh, 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 areas that are outside in, in community areas uh, through perhaps the conservancies. And in addition to that, the new, a new policy has now been passed, uh, I think in February um, of, of this year, there, there is now a sessional paper uh, which is a policy on wildlife that, that has now been, uh, and, and I, I want to encourage, um, you know, our, especially our journalists to look at those two documents, the policy and the strategy, because it really outlines what needs to be done. Now, the question is, to what extent are we implementing 
uh, that strategy and to what extent uh, is the policy being observed? I think in terms of the policy, there, there are good measures now. The Ministry of um, Wildlife and Tourism and Wildlife has now initiated a process to amend the Wildlife Act. And, and this is why this conversation is really important because some of the outcomes of this conversation can feed into uh, that process so that we the next wildlife act is going to be even more um, um, systematic in addressing uh, the issue the important issue uh, of, of, of wildlife and maybe just to add on the voice of uh, Rupi Mangat that um, is shared a, a comment around the importance and why we have to take this very very seriously because it's a grave matter uh, we would not want as a country to end in a situation where our animals are living in cages and, and therefore no longer wildlife actually if if you feed if you enclose uh, 40 lions and, and throw meat across the fence you actually are, live, are having domestic wildlife that, that's no longer uh, the natural environment that uh, Kenya prides itself on and, and so it, it just points to the the importance of, of, of taking these um, matter a little bit more seriously but also maybe to add the voice on appreciation on the number of wildlife that are killed on a daily basis on our roads uh, that is a matter that is a silent killer of our wildlife and I, I'm, I'm not sure we pay enough attention there has been uh, efforts to try and map we, where, where, when is this is uh, where and when this are uh, happening through citizen science but I think that given the improved road and infrastructure network uh, in our country and the penetration of our road system into some of the critical wildlife spaces, majority of the wildlife we are losing now is not even poaching. It's not the ivory poaching that we, we, we give a lot of um, attention, the rhino horn uh, poaching. It's, it's now more the amount of wildlife that are being killed. And, and what is worse is that a lot of the animals that are dying on our roads are the very endangered species that tend to be nocturnal and the blighting uh, lights during the night of vehicles and the careless driver that, um, you know, drivers that do not necessarily pay, are not sensitized to, to pay attention when a wild animal appears and they just drive over and knock it over and say it's just an animal. Sometimes they knock it over and, and pick it up and, 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 and you know, have some meat there. So I think this is an issue also that we need to elevate um, as, as well, including the number of wildlife that get trapped in fences. If, if you look at uh, social media right now, there is a lot of um, wildlife that try to cross fences and they get entangled in fences because people are using uh, different uh, test tensiles of, uh, of fences. And, and again, all this mostly go unreported and therefore it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. Yet if you look at the collective numbers over the year, you actually realize that perhaps uh, these are the main drivers of biodiversity loss in, in, in the country. Oh, wow. That's another story idea, uh, you know, right there about the road accidents. Maybe and, uh, if I could just add, you know, yeah. one, one piece of um, statistics. So just to add to Dixon, cheetah. Cheetah were actually fairly common around Nairobi, a place between Nairobi, Athikapiti, and Salama. They were common in Nairobi National Park. And uh, the cheetah conservation group called Action for Cheetahs Kenya had their base in a town called Salama, which is just on the Mombasa Highway. Every single cheetah in the ecosystem has been killed on the road, on the Mombasa Highway. And uh, at, as of now, there is a female cheetah with cubs in Nairobi National Park, although I highly doubt she is from the park. She, I think she was introduced there, but I may be wrong. But um, that organization had to change their headquarters because the very species they were trying to protect was killed by the road. And that was largely in part to the fact that the government was not listening to their concerns, there were so many road kills all the time because cheetahs, um, they, they like to hunt from protected areas, you know, like the grass on the side of the road is a good place for them and there's also water there. So that's why the animals come down to the roads. Sometimes you'll find predators like the small carnivores, they will come to the roads to eat on other animals that have been killed on the road. So you'll often see dead mongoose, dead several cats, dead jackals, dead hyenas, on the road, on the major highways, especially the highway up to northern Kenya and the highway down to Amboseli from um, um, Emali down to Loitokitok, you see a lot of road kills. Wow, thank you for, uh, for that addition. Uh, it's a very important uh, story to highlight. 
Uh, but what would be the solution uh, to these you know, uh, road accidents? I think that uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Kylo says it's actually the leading you know, cause of loss of the, the biodiversity now. What can be done you know, to alleviate these? Yeah, um, I, I will, I'll maybe chime in first and, and, and perhaps my colleague have uh, additional suggested solutions. Um, and, and of course, um, we, we see the role that conservancies are playing as a very important part of the solution. Uh, today we have uh, nearly uh, 6 million hectares of land that is wildlife friendly, uh, where wildlife is welcome, where um, land use is uh, actively being uh, managed to um, not to exclude wildlife. And, and I think that is something that uh, this country can be proud of. Uh, um, there, there, are, there are very few other countries that have managed to uh, engage the citizens um, at the level that this country has uh, to get um, the, the, the backing of the local communities behind it. And, and also to get uh, to see the benefits, uh, communities actually benefiting. So I think the more we can expand the area and the conservancies, the more we can place them in the right places uh, where we have the priority areas for our biodiversity, the more we are going to create a connectivity for wildlife to be uh, able to move. And, and I think the, the fact that today the current Wildlife Act has recognized wildlife conservation as a land use. In the past, all land that is not a park or that is not urban area was classified as agricultural land, which means that um, if you are not removing trees and grass and plowing and getting crops, then you are not using the land for the land use that it was uh, meant. But the, the one great thing about the Wildlife Act of 2013 is the recognition that land under conservation in a private or community setting is not idle land because that's what it was referred uh, in the past. And actually landowners who are trying to just do some bit of agriculture in a very dry place here and there to conform to the prescribed land use. Uh, I think that's a first um, 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 uh, anchor for, for our intervention. Uh, secondly, the government has come up with a national spatial planning uh, process and required that county governments actually come up with county spatial plans. Not many counties have today succeeded to do that, but um, county spatial plans are going to, because land is a devolved uh, function and, 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 and closure of corridors is actually happening at that scale, this discussion has to be taken to the county level that as counties prepare their county spatial plans, they should integrate uh, uh, wildlife conservation as, as, as a land use and begin to say that in these particular regions, what the prescribed land use is uh, pastoralism, livestock, um, you know, uh, integration. And if that can happen, the more that can happen at the county level, the more practices that are endangering the lives and movement pattern of, of wildlife is, can be addressed. The third one is the, the, the whole issue of ecosystem planning. The, the, the Wildlife Act of 2013 has required, not even recommended, required that every landscape has to be managed through a, a landscape approach, which means that ecosystem plans now have to be formulated. Uh, so far, the country has one plan in Amboseli, and I know that efforts are ongoing to create a, an ecosystem plan for Mara and Taita, but ideally every landscape with wildlife uh, needs to come out with an ecosystem plan and that ecosystem plan should inform the 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 the, 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 the county spatial plan uh, in addition to that i think the need to support protected areas as parks reserves and conservancies to come up with their own management plans uh, and these plans are now gazetted therefore they become legal documents which then provide a legal uh, layer of um, protection uh, and, and formalizes uh, the land uses uh, in a way that actually um, affords wildlife to, uh, conservation so we, we do have um, um, efforts that are already going that are positive that are contributing um, but given the urgency and, and the time um, both in terms of time and resources, uh, uh, really to call upon um, um, you know, the country, the government, the development partners, county governments to engage in land use planning, to begin uh, creating safe spaces uh, for, for wildlife. And when we do uh, infrastructure, we should do um, 
wildlife friendly infrastructure and we've seen countries that provide overpasses and underpasses and i remember for example one of our member conservancy uh, up north uh, mugie conservancy the road cut across um, uh, from Romuruti going to Maralal. And this is a tarmac road cutting through a conservation, uh, a conservancy with a lot of wildlife and, and, and increases the chance that um, you know, wildlife will be killed on the road or are unable to move because they are crawling animals that can't even like tortoise snakes that can't cross you know, large tarmac roads. So uh, underpasses and overpasses um, must be part of uh, our infrastructure development. And, and indeed, before we come up with any uh, road and railway, and let, let's think about as a country on uh, you know, where, where are the infrastructure is passing and what wildlife are using that area and, and build our road in a way that accommodates the needs of wildlife. And I think globally, they are a very good example of where, where this has been achieved. Uh, and of course, it makes our life a little bit more expensive, our construction more expensive, but I think it's worth it given the central role that wildlife plays in our economy and, and also in our pride as a country. Thank you. Yeah, that really answers a lot of our, the questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Paula, uh, do you have anything to add on that? Okay. I do, and thank you, Dixon, for, you know, he was very comprehensive what he said. I, I would say that we actually have many, many opportunities for innovations, and Africa is not short of innovators. We just need to get them into this sector to help us. Um, overpasses and underpasses used, like, for example, in Canada for caribou um, um, have been um, very effective, but they are very expensive. The bridge across Nairobi National Park for the SGR is, a, is an example of an attempt to, to do the same. You know, I think I agree with um, Dixon. Actually, the railway should have been positioned somewhere else from the get-go. It should never have passed across the National Park in the first place. Um, if you think about other forms of barriers in the way of uh, migrating animals, swimways for fish, you know, they're, they're, these have been created on rivers, so they don't have to have a massive dam, but actually they create a pathway for the fish to bypass the dam, so they don't have to try and jump over a huge dam wall. Uh, and in some cases around the world now, they're actually removing dams altogether in order to restore the proper life of, of rivers. Um, we also can obviously protect the flyways for birds and bats and protect the habitats like the wetlands or the trees and forest patches that they require as they move on their migrations through um, through Africa. But, but I want to add that, you know, it's really important from the basic get-go, we need land. We need to secure the land. Um, the land needs to be interconnected. Where, no matter how much planning or land use plans we have, they are as good as useless if there is no compliance and no enforcement. Uh, we have been commenting in the, in the question Q&A about how EIAs are being done, but actually they're hardly ever enforced. Take a look at SGR. When they built the SGR across Savo, there was already very good knowledge about where the elephants go and where those bridges should be built to allow the elephants to move, but they didn't put them where they should have gone. Why? Because they argued about the cost. So, so we need to really be uh, make errors on the side of caution, not the other way around, like promise the world, like, oh yeah, don't worry, we'll build overpasses and underpasses. We know that it's very difficult. They've been promised for Nairobi National Park, to reconnect the Nairobi Park to the Afi Kapiti ecosystem. I highly doubt that will ever happen. And they've also promised they will build a bridge from Nairobi Park to Ngong Road Forest to allow animals to move in the other direction westwards, but I don't see that happening anytime soon either. But we do know of a few amazing incidents where uh, very small investments have led to very big wins. If you look at the um, corridor out in near Isiolo for elephants, it's, it's allowed the connectivity between a huge landscape. It's allowed elephants to move from the Abadez all the way across all the landscapes, all of the conservancies through a very small underpass under the road. And then they move out into the Mount Kenya ecosystem. Now that underpass is providing vital connectivity between Mount Kenya, which is a vital world heritage site. And, and then the conservancies, Burana, Kisima, Ngarindare, Lewa, um, and the others in the North. So we've proven that we can do it. And actually where, where the landowners are, have embraced wildlife and are engaged, we see huge success. Look at Laikipia County. It's the, one of the only counties which is seeing actually a revival of wildlife numbers. And the, many of the endangered species are actually recovering. So this is really important. And what they've done, apart from 
building these concrete structures to allow animals to move, they've also used very clever fencing. This is really amazing. If you look at the way that the, those conservancies are fenced because they do want to reduce or minimize um, people in, coming onto their properties or and you know and eating their like their grass illegally or starting fires. They want to reduce the amount of human wildlife conflict. So they've created these very clever fences that have these gateways, which are almost like valves. It will allow an elephant to pass, but not a rhinoceros. So it ensures the security of rhinos. I don't know if any of you have seen them. And if anybody, any of the um, journalists would like to see photographs of this, it's a really incredible innovation that is being used all around Kenya. They are very short fences, very cheap to build, but very, very, successful in either keeping elephants back but allowing giraffes and other animals to cross or they are allowing elephants to pass through but retaining animals critical animals like rhinos from crossing so we do have a lot of knowledge but i want to go back to what dixon said you know the communities have lived with wildlife for eons they know how to live with wildlife and we need to start learning and changing our system so that we actually learn from those communities They've always lived with wildlife and they've always ensured that the land and the pasture is shared between the wildlife and the pastoralists. And so I think that if we want to succeed in having productive rangelands for wildlife and livestock, we really need to embrace pastoralism as a future um, source of the economy for Kenya. And we need to come up with clever um, ways of mitigating threats to the movement of animals and livestock you know, by, by thinking about this when we are building our fences, roads, railways, etc. cetera. Um, the Kenya's um, Wildlife Corridors and Dispersal Areas Report, which was part of a flagship project under Vision 2030, was launched in 2016, and it came up with many very important recommendations. But today, 2021, none of those recommendations have really been implemented. So as a result, that report now is out of date because a lot of change has already happened on the ground, as we all know. And I think that it's really important that Kenya takes this matter seriously, identifies what land really must be secured and puts in place the necessary policy and legislation that compels all those landowners to protect the dispersal areas and corridors. And by and doing this by providing legal and financial instruments to make it possible. At the moment, what is happening with all of these infrastructure developments across these wilderness landscapes, it's actually exacerbating the human wildlife conflict problem. And because the government of Kenya agreed to pay compensation to communities, they're now in a huge bind. They are owing billions of shillings to local communities and they can't deliver. And as a result, it's creating a hate relationship. Communities are very unhappy about what's happening. Well, what if we didn't just pay people compensation, which is not really a benefit. Compensation is not a benefit. It is simply compensation. Um, but what if we actually created benefits for people who secured their land, who create, who opened up these corridors, who provide opportunities for wildlife to share the land with their livestock? Um, I think that is the future because if the communities are benefiting from the wildlife and from conservation, then the, the communities and all our landowners would be much more likely to support the initiatives to keep these wilderness areas open, to allow the migrations to continue. Wow, that's very incisive uh, and comprehensive. Uh, what I'm hearing is uh, innovation, technology, and creating benefits for communities is one of the biggest solutions that we have. And uh, I'd like to bring Elizabeth back to the conversation. Uh, sorry, we moved off tangent. And um, there is a question. No, 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 on I the... understand. When the scientists start talking, you can't stop it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want to interrupt because they're making a lot of sense. So, uh, which is why we're having this webinar in the first place. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. And I think the, the, the thing to say is that mm -hmm. um, um, environmental law, both the formulation of it and the implementation and enforcement of it is primarily um, anchored in science much more than any other branch of law. Because we are talking about the ecology of uh, wildlife, we're talking about ecosystems, and, and, and so on, and, and the science that supports that. I think um, in respect to the particular conversation, I'm quite conscious of the time. If you allow me, Kyundo, I just want to make three, three particular points. Um, we, we are talking a lot about uh, communities and, and landowners and land users, and that um, you know, it's their land and, the, and, and they need to provide this service of, of um, 
uh, allowing animals to pass through their, their land. And there has been argument um, uh, within certain circles that as long as you're a landowner, then you should be allowed to do anything that you want with your land. And I think if we if we get the analogy from from criminal law, if I can if I can use that example, you have property in your own body, you own yourself, and yet it is a criminal offense to try and kill yourself. You will be taken to court if you attempt suicide. So what we're saying is that there's a limit to this property uh, rights um, uh, concept that people keep pushing uh, in in an effort to to evade. Or, or avoid actually the, the, the protection of, of, of migratory corridors. So that's number one. I think number two is, um, and this might be a little bit controversial, uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to take a big risk in saying it. We as Kenyans, and because I'm, I'm assuming that this is a primarily Kenyan uh, audience in terms of journalists and, and, and the issues that we've discussed mostly have been Kenyan. We have this uh, syndrome, I, you know, called Serikali's idea syndrome, you know, where everybody is sitting on their lapels waiting for the government to come, you know, to their rescue. Um, and the the question that I always have in respect to this issue that also links to the over reliance on donor funding and NGO funding for communities and for landowners in in wildlife conservation. Dixon has rightly told us that wildlife is now a legitimate land use, the same as commercial, the same as agricultural, the same as rental, all right? All of these are legitimate land uses in the eyes of the law. So when somebody, for instance, when, when the subdivision of the southern part of, of Nairobi National Park was happening, why didn't those people who are selling that land, all right, their own land to people to raise up, um, uh, high rise buildings or whatever else, why didn't they look for donor funding to enable them to use their land for commercial purposes? You understand? Why is it that they did not call the government to enable them to make use of that legitimate land use of commercial, com commercial, farm, uh, com commercial utilization of their land use? So if you're coming from the perspective that wildlife use is a legitimate land use, then we need to insist as citizens to, that government must put in place, and we as citizens must actually um, participate in that particular effort to ensure that for us to use our land for wildlife conservation, we do not need any other external support to enable us to do that. Number one, to use it for wildlife conservation and to benefit from it from wildlife conservation. Uh, Mr. Kaelo will tell you a lot about benefits accruing to communities. Uh, uh, that, that give up their land for wildlife. And these benefits don't have necessarily to be money in the pocket. Yes, money in the pocket is a good thing, but it can be additional benefits that I'm sure uh, Mr. Kaelo will be much better placed than I am to really expound on those sort of benefits. So we need to rethink the way we, we interact with this concept of wildlife use as a legitimate land use, and then how exactly communities can engage in that particular land use. I've seen, uh, lastly, I want to comment on the issue that has been raised in the comment, uh, question and answer uh, section of the, of the webinar uh, regarding EIAs. Um, we, one of the things that we must first establish is that wildlife migratory corridors, for the numbers that have been given by Dr. Kahungu and Mr. Kaelo, are largely existent on non-government land non-public land, they are existent on private land, they are existent on community land, all right? What does this mean? That these two categories of persons, quote unquote, uh, actually own this particular parcels, um, parcels of land. So if they're the legitimate land owners, it means that any development that happens on their land is a private, it's, it's a private, um, uh, contract or, or transaction between the landowner who owns the land and whoever is developing on that particular piece of land. Sometimes it's the landowner themselves who want to put up developments on that wildlife corridor. Sometimes the, the landowner has leased to another private individual. So we must recognize that in that particular situation, the government comes in to control, not really to control, to regulate the relationship between these two private entities. 
And the biggest issue with the AIA regulation is that in as much as it's a good um, regulatory provision that all development must, must first have an EIA certificate before they proceed, is that the EIA experts who actually write this uh, project uh, EIA reports are actually paid by the pro proponent proponents. I actually challenge any of the members here present to go through any EIA documents, any that you find on the NEMA website and find whether you will see whether there is any threat to the environment that has been identified as unmitigatable. All threats to the environment as per the EIA reports currently available on the government website are capable of being mitigated, which is a lie. There are some, and perhaps Dr. Kahumbu, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but there are some environmental uh, damage. There is some uh, environmental damage, I'm sorry, that is completely incapable of mitigation. But the consequences of that dam uh, damage is so severe that that project should not be allowed to actually continue. But because the person, the scientist, the EIA expert who's writing this report is getting their money from the person who wants the project to continue, then you will find that uh, they will be very happy to sell their uh, professional opinion and say that the environmental damage of this particular project is capable of being mitigated. And I think for me, that would be the main issue in terms of the way we conduct EIAs in this country. And lastly, the, in, in respect to the EIA issue as well, um, if one wanted to search through the EIAs that are currently under review to offer their public participation views, they wouldn't be able to. You will not be able to tell which EIA is in relation to which project. Why? Because there are assigned numbers, numbers that mean nothing. If you tell me an EIA report on the website, on the NEMA website, is say, uh, MBO slash 12 slash 2021 slash EPZ. What does that mean to me? That could be very well an EIA that's being put forward to create a high rise building in the middle of Nairobi National Park. How will I tell at first class? So there are, there are some things that can be sorted out, obviously, through legal mechanisms, for, inter, for instance, excuse me, changing the law on how project um, expert reviewers uh, are paid or, or how EIAs are conducted, but also there are others that can be uh, uh, addressed through administrative issues. There are others that can be addressed through uh, policy and sometimes even through uh, private law as opposed to public law and introducing government regulation into it. Thank you so much for that. So to, keep, to be clear to everyone, EIA is Environmental Impact Assessment uh, that is given oh, yes, by- I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so sometimes uh, maybe a journalist here might not uh, we, we co co be conversant uh, with uh, 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 the jargons and the abbreviations that we use acronyms. Uh, do you think that answers Stewart Thompson's question uh, that says NEMA are clearly not delivering on their stated re remit? And unfortunately, this is a very commonly encountered issue the planet over. In my 30 years of studying ecological impact assessment, that is uh, Stewart, uh, the very fabric of a global biodiversity hotspots is being eroded by ineffectual enforcement. Yeah, uh, any other take on that? Could I, could I add something, that... Junju? <clears throat> yes. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I think one of the biggest challenges with EIAs um, as, as um, Liz said, you know, every every damage is considered mitigatable, and that's a big problem. Um, and and sometimes it means that um, we allow things and we assume that somebody can mitigate, even though they may not have the expertise or the money to mitigate effectively. Uh, we can borrow from other countries. In the United States, they have a very interesting law. Um, in in East Africa, what we are seeing is developments inside our protected areas. I mean, the word protected area should have meaning. <laughs> it's supposed to protect, right? However, we have railways, roads, power lines, pipelines, oil exploration and oil drilling inside our national parks as of today. So, so these protected areas have actually become a, an easy way to move infrastructure for energy, for sewage, um, 
for power and for people in terms of roads and railways. So they are violating the actual purpose that those protected areas were set up for in the first place. And, but in the United States, they have a very interesting law that says basically, if you need to build a road on a railway and there's a protected area in the path, you may not build your road or railway through that protected area unless there is absolutely no other way to get to where you want to go. The idea of this, the uh, Serengeti Highway was to put a road right across um, a small waste in the, in the Serengeti in order to move people from the coast down to Lake Victoria at Mwanza. Um, it would have shortened the distance by hundreds of kilometers. But Tanzania was compelled by the world to reconsider. Continue doing your 400 kilometer journey. Don't cut it short at the cost of this great migration. And Tanzania had to do that. Um, who, who knows what they'll do in the future, but for as of now, they haven't done that highway that they were planning. Um, and I, I like the United States um, rule, because if we had that in Kenya, there is no way we would have had a railway cutting through the middle of the Nairobi National Park. There is no way that the Southern Station would start building a container depot and all the roads for the container depot inside Nairobi National Park because they forgot that in theory, they forgot that they needed all this extra infrastructure. Um, there would have been um, a, a real reckoning on what is the real cost of these developments? What is the real cost? Not today, but into perpetuity. Because if you were to add those real costs, you would realize that this investment doesn't make sense. The problem today is that we are only looking at the cost of how much does it cost to build this bridge today 300 kilometers or 50 kilometers. That is what is going on. It's short-term thinking um, and it's often linked to our election cycles. And I think that's one of the major problems. I think our laws need to address this. One of the things that um, Liz um, mentioned is the need for the public to be able to engage more effectively. Our, our constitution is clear. The public in Kenya have the right to participate in all these processes. But the government has not made it easy for people to participate and part of it is things like this weird labeling system on the EIAs in, the, in NEMA, even though we have one of the strongest environmental laws in the world. And so, you know, part of one of the, one of the activities we'll be doing with the Whitley Gold funding, we received a hundred thousand pounds, will be to actually develop a desk to actually support citizens because plenty of people would like to participate, they just don't know how to, and they're afraid of participating in these events because they think they'll be punished um, or they feel like it's a, there's no point. We want to make sure people are well-informed, have access to the information they need, they know what to do and they can do it and we can track because it's so important that we then hold the government to account because after all, they are the civil servants that we appointed into those positions. Thank you so much. Uh, we quickly, you know, running out of time. Uh, we have about uh, 17 minutes. Uh, we also wanted to do halfway, uh, uh, past half hour past mark, but I think we have a lot of questions uh, that we really need to answer. Uh, thank you. I've seen the panelists you've been able to address some of the questions uh, typing, and I hope you uh, participants are able to see the ones that have been answered online already. Uh, that really does help. Um, uh, there is one uh, directly to you, Elizabeth Gitari, so we can try and answer a few. Uh, you touched on the issue of land use, livestock, wildlife, corridors, farming, parks, etc., which are all different land use methods. But I believe we can't wait on county governments to take action. How can organizations like su support communities to help them understand the multifaceted issue of land use and how best to manage their community land uh, for the benefit of people, wildlife, wildlife and ecology? This, this is from Kari Mutu, who doesn't say uh, where from or which media house or which organization they, they, they come from. Uh, Elizabeth, if you could uh, answer that, that. Thank you. I, th I think I've, I actually know Kari, but I'm not sure which organization she's, she's with right now. Um, okay. Yes, yes, it's true that um, land use planning uh, is critical to the conservation of migratory corridors, and even more specifically, the management of communities, uh, of land by communities who own it. 
Um, and it is also true that we really cannot sit and wait for county government or national government to create the, the land use uh, plan that we are talking about. I think Mr. Kaelo um, outlined earlier some of the management plans uh, in respect to conservancies that communities are using. Now, the way the land use planning process is conceptualized currently in law and policy, uh, even if it's not currently being enforced as it should be, but ideally, uh, the Wildlife Conservation and Management Act provides for the creation and formulation of ecosystem management plan, plans. These ecosystem management plans would mean that there is one document that outlines how an entire ecosystem will be managed for the next one year, for the next five years, so on and so forth. So within that ecosystem, for instance, let's take the example of the Masai Mara ecosystem. Within the, uh, the Masai Mara ecosystem, you have community land, which is where the conservancies are. are. You have some bits of uh, public land and national government land. Then you also have county government land, which is uh, the Masai Mara National Reserve. If you look at um, the Amboseli uh, ecosystem as well, you have public land being the national park. You have community land being the land that is owned by the com uh, communi uh, community and the conservancies. Then you have uh, private land, which is land that is owned by individual landowners. So the, the Wildlife Act specifically provides that in planning, uh, in, in formulating the management plan, the Kenya Wildlife Service should liaise with all the landowners within that particular um, ecosystem to create one ecosystem management plan to tell us how to manage the public land, the, the community land, so on and so forth. This ecosystem management plan will then feed into the county spatial management plan, with that, which then feeds into the national uh, spatial management plan. So I'm sure that um, through uh, the Kenya Wildlife Conservancies Association, and Mr. Kello, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, uh, I know for a fact that they have supported many communities to enable them to uh, come up with um, uh, land use management plans for their pieces of land and how they want to manage them. And once the county process starts, then it is upon uh, the county and these community landowners to liaise so that this particular county, I mean community and conservancy land use management plan feeds into the county management plan. I hope that answers your question. I hope uh, it does, <coughs> and I hope it also does answer the Rupi Magat who is talk asking about uh, do you have a national land use plan? And, uh, and, and then she has a take um, that, that I don't know even one of us can comment on. Should governments lo not look at this seriously? Uh, probably that was related to human numbers not being factored in land use planning. We could end up like South Africa with protected areas fenced and then wildlife turned into wild livestock to be, tra to be traded. It may happen in the next few decades. There's, there's a national land use policy that essentially outlines how land use planning should happen across the country, but we are still to achieve one national land use plan because all the countries haven't uh, gotten their documents up to, to the higher level to create that particular document. So it's more of a, of a tributaries approach where all of these small rivers come in to form the national land use plan as opposed to uh, you know, a top-down approach where it starts from the national level and goes down. What would be the idea? Top-down or from the counties and, and then we... Oh, absolutely. How, how it's currently uh, envisioned in terms of bottom-up, you know, because it's, yeah. it's the communities and the, and the landowners on the ground that, that are best placed to decide Is it me or we've lost no, Elizabeth? I think we've lost Elizabeth. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Kyundu, uh, so, can I also comment on this issue? Yes, on, please. On the, the two issues. One is on the land use planning. Yeah, um, in one minute. Are we really uh, you know, running short now? Yeah. Well, one of the challenges yes. that uh, the land use planning, if done from the bottom up, means that you have uh, planning done at, by the level of the county when actually some of these issues are of national relevance, not only county relevance. And so you could lose the national um, benefits. 
by only treating it as a, a local issue. And this could actually undermine a lot of good conservation work that has already been done. On the question from um, Rupi about uh, should our wildlife end up in, you know, in cages or in parks and then being traded like South Africa, um, I think this is a real risk. I don't think we're talking of decades, we're talking of much sooner than that because uh, my sense is that wildlife across Africa is being seen as a commodity, no longer being seen as an ecological, um, essential ecological uh, element uh, for the, the health and wealth of our countries, but more as commodities to be bought and sold. And so I'm seeing shifts in thinking, shifts in um, plans, shifts in ideas, which we're seeing again and again, in, and a lot of lobbying from certain quarters to promote the um, ownership of animals and then the trading of those animals, which would, I think, really undermine the whole idea of wilderness, um, which is so unique to Kenya. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, and when you take that, uh, Bonakailo, are you able to take Lina Bosbori's question? Um, uh, yes. Talking about, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think one of the other missing part of, of this discussion is uh, and, and, and the challenges that we face and the solution that we are discussing today is to ask ourselves, what is the level of in investment as a country that uh, we are putting into, into environmental conservation? And I think one of the big lessons we need to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is how mismanagement of the environment can result in such dire consequences that it becomes the most important um, aspect of our own survival. And, and therefore, they need to see uh, to what extent is funding to the environment from the national exchequer appropriation through parliament uh, is able to address the, the big challenges that we do face, because they are big challenges. And if you look at the current uh, budgetary provisions and, and look at the allocation of resources uh, that goes to the environment, then you realize why some of our institutions, uh, government institutions struggle uh, to achieve their mandate. And, and really, I, I think, um, um, especially from the journalist, articulating um, through um, you know, articles, the importance of increased funding uh, to the environment sector. If you look at the current budget um, uh, that was passed recently, there is a very limited allocation compared to, for example, other departments, um, um, how much is the environment uh, sector being funded? That needs to change uh, so that then uh, NEMA, KWS and uh, KFS and all these institutions mandated to protect the environment have the resources they need. Uh, because I think some of the complaints that you may hear under undertones of their failures reflect uh, upon um, our national failure to invest uh, in generally the environment sector, including the question that was asked uh, by Stephen of CIDA FM about compensation, why it's not happening. It's basically because uh, in not, not adequate resources are, are being um, all allocated to uh, the conservation of, uh, of, of, of 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 um, of the environment. Uh, la secondly, is uh, the question from uh, Bosibori on uh, who is a journalist asking about how conservancies were surviving through the COVID um, pandemic. Of course, uh, majority of our conservancies uh, depend on tourism arrivals, uh, um, and 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 therefore, when COVID hit and and travel uh, stopped, uh, some of the costs of managing conservancies, which are largely borne uh, by the conservancies themselves, um, became a real challenge. And, 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 and so uh, maybe to answer your question, there has been um, a number of efforts that have been done by the conservancies, by conservancy support organization, and, and also by the government. Uh, to start with the government, um, the government did, uh, under the economic stimulus program, allocate 1 billion Kenya shillings. Uh, all of which went to pay salaries uh, for 3,500 rangers across the country. And, and, and while we had challenges around making available the resources because sometimes the accounts did, the, you know, did not exist or um, you know, the paperwork was not in order, uh, that has really become uh, quite a, 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 a lifeline to keep the rangers on the ground, to keep them to be supervising. Uh, and, and, and majority of our conservancies were very pleased with the government support uh, and, and, and therefore you know, are appreciative of um, the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife Intervention. On, on the other hand, the conservancies themselves 
uh, went into crisis mode, crisis funds were, were created and, uh, and, and organizations that support conservancies um, like Maasai Mara Wildlife Conservation, the Northern Rangeland Trust, uh, just to name a few, went ahead and fundraised uh, to keep the conservancies <coughs> going. But of course that meant that um, it, it, it was also an awakening call that relying on tourism and loan is not going to be, uh, is important, but it's not going to be sustainable uh, given the, 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 the fluctuation in tourism numbers. And so how can conservancies begin to uh, diversify their income base? Uh, some of the questions we are thinking about currently. Indeed, um, uh, very important. Uh, I think we have five minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, so if I could ask uh, for our speakers to kindly give us their closing uh, remarks. And you've been brilliant. I'll read you a, a message, an inbox that I've gotten. The presentation is just brilliant. These presenters have facts on their fingertips. They got examples and even statistics, and I am amazed. And also, I would say the same. Uh, so when you're doing your closing remarks kindly, uh, what is that one story uh, that you'd like to see uh, done on, on this issue? Uh, we start with you, Dr. Paula, uh, then Elizabeth, and we finish with uh, Mr. Kailo. Thank you. Wow, uh, this is, um, I think, a really, really difficult thing. I would love to see a story. I would love to see our journalists follow the stories, the ins and the outs of what really happens in uh, the efforts to negotiate agreements. Uh, we are having a, an overpass being built in Naivasha to allow the animals to move from the lakeside uh, to the north of that north road. Th this is a great opportunity to, to get onto a story at the beginning start telling the story of how uh, private citizens are working together with government to open up these corridors. I think that's going to be one of the most important things. But I also think that while we want to show shine a light on the positives and the successes, we must not shy away from the uh, emerging crises that are happening. I really think the Masai Mara is in dire straits. Um, we cannot deceive ourselves that the arrival of the wildebeest is means everything is okay. It is not okay. You just have to look at the river. You have to look at what is happening on the course of the river to know that there's a major problem. You need to talk to the rangers, talk to the guides and the people who come there to know that the animals are in distress. Uh, we need to not wait until a crisis has emerged. We need to be aware that it's coming, raise the alarm and have action taken before we lose what is really one of the great wonders of the world. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth. I, um, I don't know how best to answer that question, the, best, the story that I want to see. But I think one of the things that has consistently been missing in a lot of these news stories that we get on, on the environment is that the the idea and the truth that the environment affects all aspects of our lives never really comes out clearly immediately you and i don't know whether it's it's a training in in journalism school where you have one side and the other side of the story but with the environment environmental uh, governance and protection uh, circumstances it's never two sides of the same coin it is an all-rounded perspective because it will affect health, it will affect wealth, it will affect family, it will affect money, it will affect um, social issues. So all of these things, and it would be important to see, even if it's a series of, of stories, it, it can't fit into you know, the time frame that's, that's required. I really would like, for instance, the example that Dr. Kahumbu has given, it would be important to, to see how this relates to all other aspects of, the, of, of our existence so that then that is, is communicated clearly. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kailo. And yes, indeed, uh, Elizabeth, uh, we trained to tell both sides of the story. Uh, but that, that's a, a unique angle you know, that we've brought that we- Yes, yes, in the fashion, sorry. That, that we need to look into. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Kailo. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And, and, and really just on behalf of my colleagues and, and, and those that are involved in conservation is really to thank you and, and Internews for the opportunities that you continue to create um, to allow journalists uh, to interact with practitioners and, and to, for us to be able to tell uh, our story. Um, I really, we are very grateful for that. And of course, this opportunity for this work, uh, meeting today. I think for the journalists really, uh, really beginning to shine a little bit more light on the success stories. This country has a lot of challenges, but we also do have a lot of success stories. And, and bringing that out uh, will really inspire the country, will inspire the next generation, the young people uh, in this country to focus on solutions um, and, and therefore being able to uh, grow our investment, particularly in community-based conservation, because I think that the, 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 the battle over corridors will be won on the focus that we give to uh, community and private conservancies. They are the solutions to our challenge of today. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all our panelists, uh, Dr. Paula Kahumbu, CEO of Wildlife Direct, and Elizabeth Gitari, uh, who is an advocate uh, with the Conservation Alliance of Kenya. Um, maybe, I hope I got, maybe, uh, I hope I got that right. A correction, just so that we don't. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you allow me, Kyundu, just a correction so that we don't misrepresent. I, I'm not an advocate with the Conservation Alliance of Kenya. I just represent <laughs> them. I'm okay. managing partner at Ogolo Advocates. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. So, Thank this, you so much. the points that I'm giving here are purely mine and do not reflect in any way on conservation alliance of kenya okay uh, thank you so much uh for for that correction well, well noted and uh, dixon is the ceo of kenya wildlife conservancies association uh, thank you all so much uh for your time uh, taking time from your busy schedules uh to give us insights into the migratory uh, uh corridors and dispersal areas i think it was very incisive uh it was brilliant and to all our participants uh thank you so much i hope you've gotten a new information and uh, most importantly story ideas and as we said we'll be uh, uploading uh this uh webinar uh, recording on our website that is adjournalism.net and then we'll send an email to everyone of the attendees with all the resources. Uh, I see Dr. Paula has been uh, giving us all these resources on the chat. I will compile all these and for you speakers, if you have a report, if you had a presentation that you'd like us to share with our networks, I can do that. So when we send that resource uh, email, we can include that. And thank you so much. Uh, do uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.